Well, for nearly 2,000 years of Western history, Christianity played a vital role in the shaping and forming of this great civilization. From virtual obscurity, Christianity arose to conquer one of the greatest empires the world had ever seen, the Roman Empire. It was the teachings of Christ that served to civilize and educate an entire continent and civilization. It gave birth to the modern ideals of freedom, human dignity, equality, free market economics, and social justice. Christianity forever established as universal human virtues the concepts of compassion, love, sacrifice, and forgiveness. And the monuments of Christianity still remain from the great cathedrals that stand throughout the lands to the universities that have educated millions, to the music of Bach and Beethoven, to the literature of Dante, Dostoevsky, Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis. From the colonization of America, to the creation of our democratic government, to the abolition of slavery, Christianity has been the most powerful and most positive formative influence on culture in the history of the world. And wherever you go in the world, wherever you see Christianity flourishing, it brings personal, social, and cultural transformation. In his book, Jesus in Beijing, author David Aikman recorded the words of a leading Chinese scholar from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Speaking to a group of Westerners in 2002, he stated this. They went to discover what it is that made the West and America such a great nation in such a short period of time. And he concluded this. One of the things we're asked to look into was what accounted for the success, in fact, the preeminence of the West all over the world. We studied everything we could from the historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on your economic system. But in 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is religion, Christianity. That is why the West has been so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. These Chinese scholars recognize the foundation of America's greatness. Now at the 21st century, what can be said of Christianity in the West and here in the United States? Christianity is no longer the force it was in the past. In recent times, all remnants of our nation's Christian heritage are being systematically removed from the public square. Christian ideas are no longer welcome in the public schools and in the institutions of higher learning. Christianity is mocked and discredited in the media as a superstition of uneducated individuals. Christian moral foundations upon which our nation was founded are no longer welcome in our halls of justice and government. We are and have been for many years living in post-Christian times. How have the Christians and the churches responded? Well, many Christians and churches have chosen to retreat behind the comfort of their church walls and isolate themselves from the culture. I was just listening to a sermon of a pastor crying out to his people, come out from amongst them separate yourselves from them. He was calling them to hide behind the walls and safety of the church. However, I believe the Bible commands us differently. The Bible commands us to go out into the world and make disciples, to go out and engage our culture for Christ and the ideas of our culture. And in order for a church to effectively engage and transform its culture, it must understand the ideas that dominate the culture. You see, the gospel is never preached in isolation, but in the context of a culture and its ideas. 
Jesus was an effective and powerful communicator because he had mastered the word of God, but he also understood the culture around him. So he could not only present the Bible in a way that was relevant to the culture, but also he understood the ideas of the culture and could engage those ideas, show them, and expose the errors of those ideas and counter them with powerful evidence for the truth. The Apostle Paul is considered the greatest missionary of church history, and Paul was very effective because he also knew the Word of God, but he also understood the culture and its ideas. In <clears throat> several times in Acts, especially chapter 17 of Acts, as he entered the great city of Athens, he could engage the ideas of the Greeks, expose what was false, and present in a compelling and powerful way. In a way, those people understood the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, when you understand the culture, you know how to connect with your audience, but you also know the ideas that stand opposed to your message. This makes you a more effective and persuasive communicator for the gospel of Christ when you can speak in terms they can connect with. And instead of dismissing their ideas, you can engage their ideologies and the philosophies that hold them captive, which they ascribe to. Well, in our culture, these are the dominant ideas of our time. The first is naturalism, the worldview of our culture today. Naturalism is the worldview that the material world is all that exists. It's best summed up in the words of the late Carl Sagan, who stated in the series Cosmos, which many of us were uh, <clears throat> made to watch growing up in the public schools. And he said this in the opening phrase of the video, The Cosmos, the universe is all that is, ever was, and ever will be. Naturalism rejects the notion that there is a divine creator. It rejects the idea of a spiritual world, of life after death, and uh, that we humans have an immaterial soul or spirit. If there is no God, there's no Son of God, there can be no Word of God, and there can be no acts of God. So this worldview stands in direct opposition to the Christian worldview. And this is the dominant worldview of our times, which rules our schools, universities, media, and government. Naturalism, however, leads to a dark and dreadful conclusion that we are mere accidents in time and space. Thus, there's no ultimate meaning, no purpose or significance for our existence. I remember when I was on a radio debate with an atheist. He said, well, that's just your opinion. I said, no, I'm simply repeating what you atheists have been saying for centuries. And he said, like who? I said, well, what about one of your most outspoken atheist philosophers there, Bertrand Russell? He said this. Man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocation of atoms. We're simply an accident here. There was no purpose for our existence. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. And that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. Bertrand Russell concluded what all the athe great atheist philosophers have concluded. If we're simply accidents of time and space, there's ultimately no meaning for our existence here. No ultimate hope and purpose. The only sure thing we have to look forward to is our extinction and eventual annihilation. I remember I was a, in a communist country in East Asia, and I shared this quote with 
uh, several university students there and they were stunned at this statement. And as I moved on to the next slide, they said, no, no, go back, go back. And they kept reading this quote over and over and over again. They sat there, you could see it in their eyes, they sat there in shock, finally coming to the realization of the implications of atheism and the dreadful and dark future that awaited them if God does not exist. This life is all that there is. And the only thing we have to look forward to is our extinction. Understanding the implications of the naturalist worldview then provides a great opportunity to share Christ if we are equipped and prepared to engage this worldview. The second dominant idea of our culture is Darwinism. Darwinism teaches that the origin and the diversity of life are the result of natural forces and chance. There's no intended purpose for our existence. We are simply accidents. However, if Darwinism is true, we come to some dreadful conclusions as well. Dr. Will Provine, biology professor at Cornell University, states clearly the implications of Darwinism. He says, if Darwinism is true, it ultimately, ultimately means no life after death, no absolute foundation for right and wrong, no ultimate meaning for life, no free will. He states, ultimately, we live, we die, and that is all there is to it. The third idea of our culture is the relativism of truth. This is the result, the natural conclusion of the naturalist worldview. You see, if there is no God, if there is no creator, truth does not originate with God. If truth doesn't originate with God, where does truth originate? With me. I don't discover truth, I invent it. And since you and I have different perspectives, we're all limited. Nobody knows anything purely, objectively. Nobody has all knowledge and all wisdom. Therefore, truth is created by each individual, and therefore truth is relative. There is no fixed point by which we can measure truth. Truth, then, is not absolute. It changes from individual to individual, from culture to culture, and over time. Christians who teach that the Bible's teachings are absolute are often stonewalled by this ideology that tells them, true for you, but not for me. All truth is relative. You cannot say your version of the truth is any better than mine. And this is the ideology that dominates our universities and public arena. Just go to the University of Hawaii and ask students, is truth relative or absolute? I guarantee you, nine out of 10 of them are gonna say it is relative. The fourth idea of our culture coming out of the relativism of truth is moral relativism. This is the lifestyle of our culture. If truth is relative, then morality naturally follows as relative. The majority in our culture believe that morality is also determined by the individual or the culture. Therefore, it's always changing. For example, the debate we're having now over gay marriage. Well, traditional marriage may have been good. Uh, um, homosexual or same-sex marriage may have been wrong 100 years ago. But today, it should be an accepted lifestyle. In our culture today, the popular saying is what? Live and let live. Don't impose your values on me. No one has the right to tell anyone how to live their life. Both the ideas of the relativism of truth and moral relativity quickly unravel when individuals realize their contradictory nature and the unlivability of their positions. The fifth dominant idea, pluralism, the spirituality of our culture. Pluralism says that all religions are equally valid and true. There's no religion that has the truth on God eternal life, morality, or spirituality. Many believe it's not only wrong, but dangerous to teach one religion is true and all others are false. Many falsely assert it's this kind of thinking that has led to the wars and conflicts in our world today. 
You and I are constantly facing this ideology, aren't we? You know, just a few months ago, I attended an uncle's funeral over there in Kaneohe. And there in the chapel, uh, was about half full. And of course, coming from a Japanese heritage, uh, was a Buddhist funeral. And most of my family members know, you know, when I go, I'm not going to go up and bow to the Buddha and, and put the incense. And they know this, but they still get upset at me every time. And I uh, went to the funeral, and I said hi, and you know, tried to comfort the family. And then I sat in the back, as I usually do, just try to be real inconspicuous and not make a big deal of the whole thing. And then you know, they call your family up family by family, and you need to go up there and bow to the Buddha and put the incense in. Of course, I don't go. But I remember I was sitting in the back, just being really inconspicuous as families were being called, and our family was called, and I was just kind of hiding in the back there. And one of my cousins, a former teacher, so therefore, you know, when she talks, she's pretty loud. She came and sat behind me. And in a loud voice, she said, hey, Patrick never go out. Patrick never go up and put incense. How come Patrick never go up? And uh, my sister turned around and said, oh, he's Christian. She goes, but he should go up. How come Patrick never go up? Now the whole chapel is turned and they're looking at me. And the Buddhist priest is over there staring at me. You know, and I look back and I said, hey, don't make a big deal about it. You know, and she goes, but you should go up. You should go up. <laughs> So, of course, you know, everyone was kind of glaring at me, all upset and everything. And afterwards, of course, you know, we have lunch. And I went to the back, and I went walking into the lunchroom, and everyone just kind of gave me the evil eye. And I thought, okay, well, I won't eat uh, then. And I stood outside trying to talk to my cousins and family members, and uh, they weren't very interested in, in conversing with me. But we face the ideology of pluralism all the time, not only here in the islands, but now more frequently throughout the United States. It is a growing challenge for the church today. The final idea, um, Steve Turner sums up pluralism pretty well. He says this, we believe that all religions are basically the same. At least the one we read was, they all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. In other words, when you study the basics of every religion, the more you study them, the more you realize they are tremendously different and teach contradictory truth claims. They cannot all be right at the same time. The final ideology is consumerism, the practice of our culture. Consumerism is defined as essentially a never-ending desire to possess material goods and to achieve personal success. It is a systematic creation and encouragement of the desire to possess material goods and personal success in ever greater amounts. Richard Newhouse stated that consumerism is living in a manner that is measured by having rather than being. Many people use the term materialism and consumerism interchangeably, but there is a difference. Consumerism is much more than materialism, the desire for material possessions. It is a way of perceiving the world that has affected all of us, young and old, rich and poor, believer and non-believer in Christ, in many significant ways. Consumerism measures a person not by their character, but by their possessions, appearance, and status. It is an artificial lifestyle that is pursued with all of one's heart, soul, mind, and strength. A desire to attain happiness or, quote, the good life. Consumerism stands in opposition to the spirit of Christ's teaching. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, the apostle John stated, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Consumerism presents us with the illusion and distracts us from the cosmic eternal truth of man's sin and our separation from God. However, the ideologies and the things of this world fail to fill the emptiness of the human heart. In post-Christian times, we find that our message is contrary to the ideology and spirit of our time. We preach a sovereign, loving creator in a culture that rejects his rulership over our lives. We preach absolute truth in a relativistic world. We stand for an absolute moral code in an amoral world. We preach an exclusive salvation in a pluralistic world. And although there are powerful but false ideas that create barriers to bringing people to Christ, this also represents a grand opportunity for the sharing of the gospel if we are equipped and ready to engage the ideas of our culture for Christ. For the ideologies of naturalism, Darwinism, relativism, and consumerism offer no hope no spiritual meaning, no moral foundation, and no purpose for our existence. In our culture, especially our youth, are feeling the impact of these ideas, and people are beginning to realize the rotten fruits of such ideologies. This was revealed in a significant study conducted in 2003. The Commission on Children at Risk was formed to study the social, moral, and spiritual foundations of a child's well-being. The commission included 33 doctors, research scientists, and mental health professionals from nations around the world. Most of these were not believers in Christ. And these researchers were not conservatives either, but from various views. And their findings revealed some frightening statistics that one in 10 students suffer from clinical depression. They summed up their findings, stating this, we're witnessing high and rising rates of depression, anxiety, attention deficit conduct disorder, thoughts of suicide, and other serious mental, emotional, and behavioral problems among US children and adolescents. They identified the cause as this, a lack of connectedness, close connections to other people, and deep connections to moral and spiritual meaning. And this is what the commission recommended. Remember, the vast majority are not, are not believers in Christ here, but this is what they recommended. For what may be the first time a diverse group of scientists and other experts on children's health is publicly recommending that our society pay considerably more attention to young people's moral, spiritual, and religious needs. You see, the present values of our culture stand in conflict with God's truth and the very nature and yearnings of the human heart for which we were created and designed. We're born with a God-given desire to find meaning and purpose for our existence here, to make sense of life and reality, to discover truth and live according to that truth. There's a longing for relationships with God and with one another. There's a longing for truth. And at this time, the world is looking, and looking over at Christians to see if we can offer any answers and if there's any substance to our message. You know, when I was speaking at Cornell University, it was very interesting. At Cornell there, one of the top universities in our country, I remember touring the campus and uh, many beautiful waterfalls that cut through the campus with these gorgeous bridges. But at all of these bridges are these bars, you know, like, like jail. You know, it looked like kind of you're crossing over a jail into a high security zone or something. And I remember after crossing about the fourth or fifth bridge with these ugly gates and bars on them, I said, I asked our guide, I said, how come you got all these ugly fences and gates on your beautiful bridges here? He said, oh, well, that's because we have a high rate of suicide on this campus we have the highest rate of suicide here. And our 
um, dean of students and counselors are horrified with how many phone calls they need to make every semester for students who jump over these bridges and commit suicide. <clears throat> and I thought about it. Wow, Cornell University, where Carl Sagan, Will Provine, and other great, uh, the top atheists, uh, philosophers, and scientists once ruled. You know, our Ivy League campuses, all of them were created first as what? Seminaries and Bible colleges to train young men for the new frontier. Except Cornell. Cornell has no religious affiliation whatsoever. It was created purely as a secular campus. There's no chapel there at Cornell. There. And uh, I thought, gee, how interesting. The stronghold of naturalism and atheism springing forth from the halls of this campus, and it has the number one suicide rate. You know, when I was speaking at other Ivy League schools and other universities in the country, they said, oh, yeah, we all know. We call Cornell Suicide University. We all know that. Well, I was invited there to speak at what was called the Lion's Den, where I would go in and I'd present my case for Christianity for 30 minutes, and then for 45 minutes, the students could ask any question they want regarding Christianity and the truth of Jesus Christ. And we didn't know how many people showed up. I was there in the uh, religion hall. The Muslims were praying outside. The Jewish students were praying upstairs. We didn't know how many people or who would show up. Well, the auditorium there could seat 400 students, and that night, over 500 showed up. It was absolutely packed. There was not an open seat there. They had to create an overflow room real quickly where over 100 students went in and watched a live video stream. And who am I? I'm not Billy Graham. I'm, I'm just a guy from Hawaii, man. You know. And uh, the campus ministries said they had not seen anything like this on the campus. And as I spoke with the professor, he said, man, in my 30 years here at Cornell, I've never seen anything like this. He said, something is happening, not just here at Cornell, but at Ivy League schools throughout the East Coast. You see, students understand instinctively there's something more. And they've got deep questions regarding what is the meaning of my existence? What is truth? Is there a God? Is there a God who can provide meaning and purpose for my existence here? They're asking those deep questions, and they're not finding it in their classrooms. So they're seeking it. Uh, and we have a great opportunity if we're ready to engage those ideas for Christ. Well, in light of the times we face, what are we called to do? Some Christians and churches choose to retreat from the culture and isolate themselves behind the walls of their churches. But I believe the Bible calls us to engage our culture for Christ, to take on those ideas and challenge those ideologies and present a compelling case for the truth of Jesus Christ, especially in our time when in the post-Christian days we find ourselves the gospel is not so welcomed in the public arena. How do we meet the challenge? First, we're to meet the challenge compassionately, with the heart. John chapter 13, before he was to go to the cross and demonstrate the greatness of his love, Jesus Christ said this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So also are you to love one another. We're to love one another as Christ loved us. Something impossible for us to do on our own. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to enable us to live the supernatural Christian life and, and, and to love one another modeled for us as Jesus Christ. He says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world will know we are his disciples if what? If we love one another. We love one another as Christ loved us. We don't always do a great job. Huh? Walk into a lot of churches and there's a lot of fighting going on on, on secondary doctrinal kind of issues. Um, a lot of infighting going on. Uh, and that ruins our witness to the world. But Jesus said, if you love one another as I have loved you, the world cannot help but notice 
hey, there's something going on over there. There's something that's not of this world with those group of people. And you catch their attention. He said, by this, all people will know you, my disciples, if you love one another. It doesn't guarantee they'll come to Christ, but they'll definitely recognize something beyond this world is going on over there. And they'll want to come and check it out. You know, I remember as a youth pastor, as a young man, you know, many people came to Christ. And there was one man, you know, Tony, he used to come and, uh, to the apologetics series that I was doing presenting evidence for Jesus Christ and the kids were encouraged to bring their unbelieving friends and hear a case for Jesus Christ and he came and he heard all my sessions never came and spoke to me or anything and then uh, after that session was done he came for a few weeks afterwards and he just kind of sit in the back and he wouldn't say much and then kind of leave right after well finally at, at a party at someone's house I finally cornered the guy I said hey, Tony you've been coming for several weeks you, know, you got any questions on anything we talked about? He goes, no. He said, your arguments were pretty compelling. I've, this is the first time I ever heard there was evidence for Jesus Christ. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, um, anything else I can answer? He goes, no. He said, but I just came to see if you guys actually live out what you say you believe. And he said, there's a lot of love here, you know. It's a different kind I had not experienced before, kind of an unconditional acceptance. I said, I said, well, I hope so. That's what Christ commanded us to do. And then I just looked at him and said, do you uh, want to pray to receive Christ? And he goes, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, it's simple like that. You know, but he wanted to see not only is the message true, but do these people live out what they believe? And if you do, the world cannot help but notice there's a difference there amongst those people. So we're to meet the challenge compassionately with the heart. But love alone doesn't bring people to Christ. You always got to have a combination of truth and love. They go hand in hand. Love alone doesn't bring people to Christ. How do we know that? For God so loved the world, he gave everything he had, his only son, Jesus Christ. So is the whole world Christian now? No. You need truth and love together. You've got to meet the challenge with compassion, but also with the mind intellectually. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 5, we demolish arguments and every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The word destroy there or demolish in some of your translations, it's the Greek word kata skapto. Kata means to dig down. Skapto means to throw over. Therefore, the picture is to dig down under a walled fortress and overthrow or destroy the walls that protect that city. See, Paul is given a picture here of men attacking a well-protected fortress. Before you can take captives, you've got to destroy the walls that protect that fortress. And through training, the Christian is to dismantle false arguments that fortify people's unbelief of the gospel, to demolish the false ideas and deceptions that people believe. So Paul is using the image of an army attacking a fortress and tearing down the walls of protection. The unbeliever is like a man in a fortress who protects himself from surrendering to Christ and the walls that protect him are the false ideas and false beliefs that he has come to embrace. And Paul says we tear them down. You see, many in our post-Christian time will not take your message seriously until they hear some good reasons why they should. And therefore, each one of us as a believer in Christ is called to equip ourselves to present the truth in a compelling manner, but also to refute the false ideas that people embrace. And unfortunately, the mind is one of the most neglected aspects of the Christian life. George Barna did a recent survey, and he listed six reasons why young people are leaving the church. Number one, the churches seem overprotective. Young people are 
facing ideas and worldviews that oppose the Christian worldview. And instead of engaging those ideas, instead of being, you know, instead of explaining why those ideas are false and engaging those ideas, instead, the church just simply dismisses it and says, hey, don't believe that. Just, just believe this. Don't ask questions. Just believe this. It stated, uh, much of the experience of Christianity for many of these 18 to 29-year-olds is stifling, fear-based, and risk-averse. The 18 to 29-year-olds said Christians demonize everything that is outside of the church. They also stated in this category that the church is ignoring the problems of the real world. In other words, church is not engaging the ideas of the culture. They're just saying, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Don't touch, don't go near those ideas, right? But young people are being bombarded with ideas and worldviews that challenge their faith in Christ and are not finding Christians who can present to them compelling and powerful answers that engage those ideas. Instead, they're being told, don't, don't watch that. Don't read that book. No, no, no. Ignore what the teacher is saying. Just, just don't listen. All right? Second, teens and 20-somethings, experience of Christianity is shallow. Teens are asking some very deep questions about truth, about the meaning of life, about the ideas that they are facing. And they're only finding very superficial, shallow answers coming from the church. You and I as believers in Christ have got to develop the depth of our faith and the knowledge of our, uh, the understanding of the Word of God and theology and the ideas of the culture that we can present some very meaningful and in-depth kind of answers to the tough, deep and meaningful questions that our young people are asking us today. Third, Churches come across as antagonistic to science. Many young adults feel disconnected from church or from their faith because they see the things that they're learning in the science seem to directly contradict their faith in Jesus Christ. And most of the young people are told, just ignore the data. As the Bible says, this, ignore all that data that you see there. Well, you see, science is a very powerful force in our education system, and, it, and we need to address the data and the issues that they are learning and explain to them where the errors are, where there is truth, and how it indeed supports the Christian worldview. The young adults, many of from a Christian background, felt that churches are out of step with the scientific world that we live in. Others stated that Christianity is anti-science. More research shows that many scientific-minded young Christians are struggling to find ways of staying faithful to their beliefs and their professional calling in science-related industries. Many young people don't understand it's the Christian worldview that gave birth to the modern sciences. Study the founders of the modern sciences, Babbage, <coughs> Newton, Faraday, Pascal. They were men deeply committed to God. And it's the Christian worldview that gave birth to the sciences because these men understood that we have a rational creator who created, who designed an ordered universe and the design of the designer could be discovered, and that's what made the sciences possible. However, they are finding that when it comes in the churches, people are saying, ignore the science, ignore, ignore all that data, just believe, man, just believe. Okay? They're looking for some, can the Christian worldview uh, not only answer these challenges, but how do they put the data together? Well, to address this challenge, by the way, great timing. There is a great conference, July 12th through 14th. Christianity and science, enemies or allies, and many young people will be surprised at the answer 
they discover. Fourth, young Christians' church experiences related to sexuality are often simplistic and judgmental. We're often quick to condemn immoral behavior without explaining why or giving good reasons why we should believe God's word and follow the ethical law he has presented there. Fifth, they wrestle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. Young people today have friends from all kinds of different faiths and they're asking how can God eternally punish such great and wonderful people like my Buddhists or Hare Krishna or atheist friends. How can a loving God do that? Christians not only need to be able to defend the Christian message and the truth of Christ's teaching, but why all religions cannot be true at the same time. And finally, the church feels unfriendly to those who doubt. Many young people have deep questions about life and their faith in Jesus Christ. And many say the church is not a place that allows them to ask deep questions they're struggling with about life and their faith in Jesus Christ. They, they do not feel safe admitting that sometimes Christianity doesn't make sense and they're looking for answers. However, instead of engaging the young person with the deep questions they have, the church simply says, just believe, just believe. Don't doubt, don't ask questions, just believe. And that's a real turnoff to a young people who are, see, who are asking some deep questions and struggling with some very deep issues. Are we prepared to engage and present a compelling case for Christ and wrestle and give some solid, meaningful, deep answers to the kinds of questions our young people are facing as we live here in this post-Christian world. It's the job of every Christian to not only develop your heart and your spirit and your soul, but your mind as well, to engage the ideas of the culture and to engage unbelievers who are asking some really deep questions and wrestling with some deep issues. Well, although we face some very formidable challenge, we live in a culture that views Christianity negatively and powerful ideas that oppose our faith in Christ. When we can outlove and outthink the culture around us, we have an unbeatable combination. You know, I asked my church history professor, I asked him, how was it that the early church, with no resources, with no uh, power, was able to transform the Roman Empire uh, so quickly? And he summarized it best. He said they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they could outlove and outthink the culture around them. And when you have that combination, that is an unbeatable combination. <clears throat> well, do we have that equipping today? Are we filled with the Spirit? Can we outlove and outthink the culture around us? If we're equipped and able to, we can engage our culture for Christ and transform our culture for the kingdom of God. It's the responsibility of every Christian, every church, and every ministry to equip themselves to be filled with the Spirit, to outlove and outthink the culture. And when you are equipped in such a way, God can use you as a powerful tool to engage and transform your culture for Christ. And I pray that be true for every person here at Calvary Chapel Windward. Say the life that we're living. Some people.
simple sway is just to give up and turn away. Some will shake their heads and say, my faith is just a
stand together. Lifting me 